Well, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1. Today we're looking at verses 40 to 45. Lord willing, we'll be concluding chapter 1 today. The title of the sermon is called Cleansing the Leper. So let us give attention to the reading of God's word, Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Move with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it. And to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And the people were coming to him from every corner. This is God's holy and inspired word. May he add his blessing to it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful to be here together, to be under the preaching of your word. Lord, we are in awe of how we have seen Christ as our king as a one who comes ushering in the kingdom of God, overthrowing the kingdom of Satan. Lord, we're thankful we get to see how he has authority and power over all the realms, over the realms, the spiritual realm, the physical realm, and the human realm. So Lord, help us to see and be impressed with Christ today. Illumine our minds to understand your word, and we pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. If you had a deadly disease, and you knew there was only one person in the entire world that had that cure, what links would you go to to get to that person for the cure? What would you do? What would you pay? What would you give for the cure? Today in our passage today, we see a man who did have a deadly disease, but he knew one who had the cure. And he goes to him in desperate need. And in so doing, we see a picture of our spiritual condition and what Christ has done for us. Now, just for background, as what we have seen so far, we have seen in the book of Mark that Jesus is continuing to advance his kingdom, that he is the promised Messiah, he is the Son of God, that he is the promised King. We saw the forerunner come and announce his entrance into the world to prepare the way for the people. And now that he's here, the king takes the center stage. He comes proclaiming the gospel of God, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. We saw that he was baptized. We saw that he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, and he overcame. And from there, he proclaimed the gospel. He proclaimed repentance. He proclaimed the kingdom of God was at hand because the king was here. And in so doing, he then starts calling followers to himself. He calls his disciples. From there, he sees them heal. Jesus starts advancing his kingdom. And it starts off first with preaching. Second, it starts off with healing. And the healings and miraculous signs we learned were not an end of themselves, but they were there to complement and support and authenticate the message he proclaimed. So there we see Jesus casting out demons, healing the sick as he healed many people. We then see him preaching and praying in a desolate place and people searching for him because he is popular. He is, his reputation has grown. He is one who has healed the sick. And so Jesus continues and, and he goes out through all the towns in Galilee preaching, casting out demons and healing the sick. Today in our passage, we come again to Jesus advancing his kingdom and showing he has power over the physical realm. We see today Jesus comes up to a leper. In fact, the leper comes to him. Leprosy was one of the most feared diseases in the ancient world. It was usually a disease that could not be cured by any mere man. And it was usually just a slow, painful road to death. The social ramifications might as well have been a death sentence. 
You were ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. You were treated as an outcast. And this would involve much bad things to the flesh, rotting flesh, nubs and fingers that would rot away, rub off. It was a disease where the nerves would just stop working and you could no longer feel pain. So they would continually be functioning as they normally would. And in so doing, they couldn't feel the pain and would literally be rubbing off their fingers, toes, limbs, nose. As a result, wounds and sores would develop and flesh would rot away. In scripture, we see leprosy likened to sin. In a sense, we also have a deadly disease that needs a cure that only one person can cure. Both sin and leprosy contaminates. It spreads. Both are disgusting. Both need to be cured or they'll result in death, but they cannot be cured by mere men. While leprosy destroys the body, sin destroys the soul. The big idea we will see in our passage today is this, because Jesus is the king of all creation, who has power over all realms. He alone has the power to cleanse from all sickness and disease. Thus, we should come to him by faith and worship the king. Now, we're going to see this today in four ways. First, we're going to see a self-aware, desperate plea. Second, we're going to see the king's compassion and willingness. Third, we will see the king's warning and instruction. And then fourth, we will see a caution of misplaced zeal. So let's consider the first point, a self-aware, desperate plea. Look at with me at verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. This, upon reading it, especially for the Jews, this would have been highly offensive. This would have been an encounter that would have been very offensive. It would have been a big deal in their eyes because leprosy was one of the most feared diseases of the ancient world. As we said, to have leprosy was a death sentence. It had major social and economic consequences. It also carried spiritual consequences. In fact, if, if you're a Jew trying to live a devout Jewish life back then, this is probably the worst thing that can happen to you. To get leprosy meant you were cut off from the covenant community, which means you're cut off from worshiping God because God was in the midst of the camp. But you, as a leper, were cast out of the camp. You were considered an outcast. You were cut off. And the covenant community was everything for the, for the Jew. Notice how Aaron in the Old Testament describes leprosy. We see in Leviticus 12 when Aaron and Miriam are, are questioning Moses. Uh, God comes and corrects them and there's a cloud that overshadows them. And it says, when the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, oh my Lord, do not punish us. Because we have done foolishly and have sinned, let her not be as one dead, whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of the mother's womb. Pretty dramatic way to describe it. Pretty crazy way there. A leper is basically rotting to death. You can call them the walking dead, if you will. Because literally... They were rotting away, and death would soon follow. So you read verse 40, and, and it should be offensive, right? A leper came to him, him that is Jesus. This should be shocking for the original hearers and for us. This is inconceivable for them. Lepers were forbidden by to come to anyone. Might as well even... Even a, a, a prophet. They were the outcasts of outcasts. In Leviticus 13, verse 45, we read, A leprous person who has a disease shall wear torn clothes. Let their, 
the hair of their head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean as long as he has a disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. This was a life of shame. This was a life of unworthiness. And so to read this sentence, and a leper came to him, this is crazy. Surely he has crossed the line. He has, he's breaking all the rules here. He's breaking the regulations of the Mosaic law. He comes running to Jesus in desperation, not caring what other people think. And so here he is. He's coming into the town because Jesus is in the town. So he's, he's leaving his, his place of outside the camp. He's coming inside. He's coming in desperation, and he comes to Jesus. Notice how many times in just these two verses alone, the word unclean is mentioned. Five times. When you are unclean, you cannot come before God. When you are unclean, you cannot be around God's people. If you're a leper during this time, you can't be in the, the land. You can't be with God's people. You cannot worship them. In fact, you must keep your distance. And when you see someone, you must yell, unclean, unclean, so they can run away. It's a life of shame. And so this leper, hearing these rumors about who Jesus was and, and what he has done, healing many people, comes in desperation. This leper was so desperate. Notice it says, He came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. So he comes running in desperation. The word here for imploring is a strong and urgent plea. It's a present participle indicating a continual plea. So he was just repeating his request, Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean. This is shocking. He's desperate because there is no other cure. This, he is on a death sentence, and he doesn't care what any others might think because he knows there's one who can heal him. He is so self-aware of his horrible condition. He is so desperate to be clean. Notice it says, and kneeling. This means to, to prostrate oneself, which is other translations can translate as worship. So he comes literally kneeling down, prostrating himself, worshiping him, and pleading to Jesus, you can make me clean. He said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. The word here for clean merely isn't, hey, you can, make, you can heal me, but it also carries, you can make me ceremonial clean. He knows Christ is the only one sufficient to save from his depraved state. He has the faith that Jesus is able, but his request is, Jesus, are you willing? Jesus, will you be willing his faith is in Jesus' power and ability, but he recognizes it's only determined if Jesus wills. He doesn't come and demand it. He doesn't come and say, this is my right, Jesus. You must do this to me. He comes recognizing the ability, but then comes in a desperate plea, asking, Lord, if you will. He recognizes no no man can cleanse but Jesus alone. He has the faith, as Jesus spoke of in Luke 18, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Knowing Jesus has been the only one to cleanse anything like this, the leper comes in utter, self-aware desperation. Like this leper we too must be utterly self-aware of our desperate condition. We must be understanding of who we are outside of Christ. In and of ourselves, we are depraved sinners. 
We are in desperate need. We sin because we are sinners. We have inherited this condition from our father, Adam. And as a result, we, we are those who, who see God's law. God demands absolute perfection and we as creatures should do it. But because of our sin, we fall short. We break God's law and we deserve condemnation. And we, there is no amount of good that we can do to have or earn a right standing with God. What we must need is to recognize our sinful condition, our desperate condition, and run only to the one who can help us, the Lord Jesus Christ. So are you aware of your own uncleanliness? Do you see the depravity or have you seen the depravity of your sin and run to the only one who could heal you? We too must come to Christ alone who is able to save. So let's consider the next point, the king compassion and willingness. Look at verse 41. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. So Jesus here sees him. The leper comes, and Jesus doesn't hightail it and be like, Whoa, a leper, I must get out of here. He's moved with pity. The word for pity here means can also be translated as compassion. Jesus is a compassionate Savior. He shows compassion on those in need. If you follow Jesus in, in the scriptures and see what he does, it, it often says move with compassion. He was moved with compassion. He showed pity on them. We have a compassionate Savior. Notice how he shows his compassion. Move with pity, he stretched out his hand. We've all seen someone who is filthy, someone in a disgusting state, maybe someone who's living out on the streets who, who haven't bathed in months, who's, who's wearing the same clothes and, and, and just soiled in their own excrements. We've all seen that and, and in and of ourselves maybe been disgusted, but some of us even move with compassion where we would be willing to, to do something, maybe give them Give them some clothes or give them some food or, or hand them some money. But how many of us would actually do what Jesus does next? He stretched out his hand and touched him. Being so moved with compassion, he didn't just stay in a compassionate state. He acted on it. He did something about it that showed he was compassionate. He stretched out his hand and touched him. Now, if you're a Jew reading this back then, if you think the leper coming to him was inconceivable, this is beyond inconceivable. You have a, a prophet now, Jesus, a, a king, we could say, though they didn't recognize him as that yet. We have one who is not unclean coming and touching someone who is unclean. This is unthinkable. Someone touching a leper? This is even more unfathomable than the leper coming. To look on someone with such compassion, who is in such a pitiable state that most others are disgusted from and would run by, they would run the other way, this is the most unthinkable thing someone could do. But this is exactly what Jesus does. He reaches down and touches him. This leper, as long as he's had this disease, probably has never known this kind of compassion, has never even much less felt a touch of another human since he's had this disease, not even by his wife or children because he was forced into isolation. Well, why did Jesus touch him? Surely he could have just, just said by the word of his power, be clean, and it would have happened. But this is an act that shows he's compassionate. It's showing that I am identifying with you. I am compassionate to 
to you. The Lord of the universe, the creator of all creation, comes down and is compassionate and identifies with a lowly, unclean sinner. Under the Levitical law, to touch a leper was to extract his defilement and then also be unclean. But here Jesus is identifying with him, willing to incur the uncleanliness of the leper for the sake of the leper being clean. What compassion. Notice what Jesus says. He said to him, I will be clean. This uh, phrase here, I will, uh, the tense is in the present, which indicates continual effects. So it's as if Jesus is saying, I am willing, and I always am willing. I will be always willing. Christ is not only is he able, he's willing. He is a willing Savior. Together, this word of willingness with his touch is a great act of compassion. We have a willing and able Savior. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Notice the result of what Jesus says in his touch. Look at verse 42. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. Notice again, the leprosy, the disease, the sickness obeys the word of the Lord. The king of all creation who is ushering in his kingdom, showing that he has power over the physical realm. This disease must obey, and it does. This disease that has done probably years and and work of decay over the years, that had probably rotted away some of his fingers and toes and limbs and nose, that have left him with, with his skin kind of rotting away. Notice, in an instant, it left him. In other words, it wasn't gradual. Jesus didn't say, hey, you know, take two, call me in a couple weeks. Let's see how it is. He didn't just prescribe antibiotics. He spoke, he touched, and it happened. Fingers are instantly back. Nose is instantly back. He was a walking corpse, is now immediately well, normal, healthy. Imagine that. A deadly disease that had separated you from the people of God and from being able to worship God. You have to live in isolation outside the camp and in shame the rest of your life. And whenever you near people, say, unclean is now made well. Notice, and he was made clean. This was not merely a miracle of healing, but the phrase here, made clean, is to indicate cleansing. In other words, he's no longer unclean. He's no longer ceremonially unclean, but he is ceremonially clean. The law says even if you touch a leper, you will contract his uncleanliness. And you yourself would have to be put outside the camp. One person said, instead of Jesus contracting the leper's uncleanliness, the leper contracts Jesus' righteousness, his cleanliness. Jesus is, is demonstrating exactly what Mark has been saying all along, that Jesus truly is the Christ, the Son of God. He is that promised Messiah. He is the King who has power over all creation, who is ushering in His kingdom. Luke 7, 22, when, when John the Baptist doubted, you know, is Jesus the Messiah, what did Jesus say? He answered him and says, Go and tell John what you've seen, And heard, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. This is in fulfillment to prophecy in Isaiah. The death here, the dead are raised up. The poor have the good news preached to them. He says, this right here is evidence that I am the Messiah. You go tell John that, what you see. So this leper who's been leprous, we don't know how long, probably all his life, probably living in isolation, probably in shame, 
is in desperate need. He hears there, he's a, there's a cure. He's utterly self-aware. He comes running. He says, Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus doesn't run, but he lets him come. And not only that, he has compassion enough to touch him and says, I will be clean. And he was made clean. We're not just to think of physical cleanliness, but spiritual cleanliness here. That is, Jesus has the power to cleanse physically, yes, as we see here, but also spiritually. As we saw, leprosy is, is a parallel in Scripture, synonymous to, to indicate a picture of sin. Jesus has the power to cleanse from our desperate state of depravity, of sin. Being cleansed from our sin means we are fit to worship and serve God. And what Jesus is so doing as he's placing his hand and identifying with him is saying, I'm willing to trade places with this man. And that's what he's willing to do with us. We who are depraved sinners, Jesus then goes in our place. He's our substitute to pay for our sins. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. What we are needed to do, pay for our sins, Jesus comes, identifies with us, and goes in our place. This is a picture of the gospel right here. Acts 15, 8, And God, who knows the hearts, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. It's through faith we're cleansed by Christ. 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light, he is the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. So have you recognized your sinful condition before a holy and righteous God? Do you see your utter uncleanliness because of your sin? But do you see Christ as the only solution? Have you run to him, cast yourself on him and pleaded with him, Lord, cleanse me. And has the Lord touched you? Has the Lord healed you today? So we have seen a self-aware, desperate plea. We have seen the king's compassion and willingness. Now let's consider the king's warning and instruction. Look with me at verse 43. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. This phrase here for sternly charged him uh, means a strong warning. It carries the idea behind it of being scornful or indignant. The Greek verb actually expresses a deep emotion, even that of anger. So it's almost here a rebuke. Notice what else. And he sent him away. This is also a pretty forceful verb here. Literally, it can be translated as he cast him out or he threw him out. And upon reading this, you know, we can get caught up in, yeah, Jesus is compassionate, but then it seems that he's angry here. How does this go along with his compassion? What's going on here? Well, I think it's twofold. Even though he was desperate, even though this, this leper dis, uh, saw his desperate condition, saw his need and ran to the one who had a cure, he still disobeyed God's law to do it. He, yet Jesus was so moved by compassion, he still did not overlook this man's violation of God's law. Luke 17, the le these lepers came to Jesus in a proper way. They didn't come, but they maintained their distance. It says, along on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. 
And he entered the village and was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. These lepers did it in the right way. And then Jesus would go on to say, I'm willing, be cleansed. But this leper disobeyed all the law of God, all that we see in the Mosaic law, for the purpose of being cleansed. Yet Jesus does show compassion. He does show grace to him. Yet he still is serious about God's law. Second reason I think he's kind of stern here is he knows that even though warning him, is going to go on to disobey him on what he's going to say. Brian Borgman says this, Though our Savior is filled with compassion and is wonderfully patient, he also does not overlook or take lightly our transgressions of the law of God. That's right. Jesus was still stern. He, he was still, uh, he laid it out straight for him here. He didn't just sweep it on the carpet. But Jesus did show him compassion and grace, yet at the same time, didn't overlook, didn't take lightly the transgressions against God's law. Look at verse 44. And said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. So Jesus warns him strongly, see that you say nothing to no one. Why does he tell him this? Couldn't this man be a pretty good witness for Christ? I mean, he just received a grace work here. Well, due to many misconceptions about Jesus, people were following him for all the wrong reasons. There were so many wrong ideas and expectations that people had for what the Messiah would do. Some thought he would be this political Messiah who would overthrow Rome. Many people heard and they saw his work and they labeled him merely as a miracle worker and he developed a following because of that. The people came in droves. They wanted to be healed. They wanted sick. They didn't really want to hear his message. But Jesus wasn't into attracting a crowd. He was about proclaiming the truth. He was to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and he called people to repent and believe. And the miracles and, and all that that he did, the healings, were to authenticate the message. So he goes, I don't want them to misunderstand my messianic intentions here. So don't say anything about this healing. He goes, don't say anything because I don't want them to get the wrong idea. I don't want them to think this is an attraction show. I don't want them to think this is merely a healing ministry. Jesus wanted the word to get out about his Messiahship based on his own terms. He wanted the people to come to him for the right reasons. And so the result is he charged and restricted people from telling what took place so the crowds would not come for the wrong reasons. William Hendrickson says this, Jesus and Mark wanted to make very plain that his primary ministry was not healing but redemption. And redemption comes through the message that he proclaimed. Notice what else Jesus says. But go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. So Jesus gives him a specific task here. It's not just be quiet. It's not just, hey, you don't say a word, you shut up. It's I'm giving you a specific task. Here's what you need to do. Here's your specific ministry. You are called to be a testimony to Christ, to these priests. Jesus commanded him to be a witness to the Jewish priests by saying, here is me, I, I am healed. I'm here to do what Moses commanded me. I mean, think about it. If you're a Jewish priest during this time, it's not every day someone walks into the temple and says, hey, I'm here to do what Moses required for the cleansing of a leper. In fact, this probably never happened in their lifetime. And so think of the effect that would have had 
if someone they've seen that they knew is a leper, maybe they've, that they came through the gate from the wilderness, they passed, came into the town, they, they saw him in the, in, the, in the distance, and they knew who this was, and now he's here at the temple, and he's saying, I'm here, here's what Moses told us to do, so I'm here to do it. They would have been floored. That would have been earth-shattering. And Jesus tells them to do this because this is what Leviticus talks about. Leviticus 14. This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then if the case of the leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, and it goes on to indicate here's what must happen. There's this ritual of atonement that must take place. It goes on and details the, the acts that the, the priests are to do for his cleanliness. All the rituals that signals atonement. In verse 18, it says, The priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. The priest shall offer the sin offering to make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanliness. So the priests are called to, to make atonement for this person, to usher him back into the covenant community so he can be clean. clean. It wasn't every day this happened. In fact, this didn't happen pretty much ever. It happened once or twice in the Old Testament. What a witness that would have been to them. If this man was able to do what Jesus told him the impact of that ministry may have been substantial. What would that witness have done for them? And this is the ministry Jesus gives this man. A great duty. Think of what could have taken place. So we have seen a self-aware, desperate plea. We have seen the king's compassion and willingness. We have seen the king's warning and instruction. Now let's consider a caution of misplaced zeal. Look at verse 45. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and the people were coming to him from every quarter. So the man didn't listen to Jesus' advice or Jesus' instruction. He didn't fulfill the ministry Jesus gave him to do. In fact, he said, no, you think I, I know something better. It says he, he went out and began to talk freely about it. That means he, he went into the town and, and told everybody. This phrase for talk freely is caruxo, which means to preach. So this man who is previously a leper, we can say the man previously known as the leper, takes his own initiative to preach. But Jesus had told him, you go straight to the temple. Don't say anything. Go straight to the temple and you see the priest and you do what Moses required. He doesn't want to do the ministry Jesus wanted him to do. Instead, he wanted to preach. Think of the excitement of this man. He's overwhelmed with joy. The one who once would go around to say, unclean, unclean, at the very chance he got to proclaim, I am clean, I am clean, he wants to go and do it. He wants to let everybody know, hey, I, I'm well, I'm clean, I'm part of the community, I, I can be together again, I can worship with you. He's been restored, but he doesn't go through the proper means. He doesn't do the proper testimony Jesus asked him to do. He no longer has to receive the, the looks of disgust, the, the ridicule. He no longer has to have people running away from him, but they can approach and even touch him. And in this excitement and zeal, he just wants to tell everyone of what just took place. But this zeal is misplaced because it's a direct violation of the command of Jesus. He doesn't follow the commands of the king. He is in direct disobedience to the Lord. He doesn't follow the expected protocol as outlined in Leviticus that Moses commanded. Sure, he, he was zealous. He, he was well-meaning, but he was disobedient nonetheless. 
And in doing so, he hindered Jesus' ministry. He was not authorized to preach to everyone. Brian Borgman notes, an unauthorized preacher with an unbridled zeal will usually do more damage for the cause of Christ than 10 good preachers can do for the cause. So his zeal to preach, while being true, caused people to focus on the wrong things. It caused them to focus not on our glorious Messiah and the message he proclaimed, but on the works he did, the miracles themselves. And so as a result, Jesus' ministry was hindered. There would be a proper time to preach, but now was not that time. While he was likely well-meaning, while he was zealous, it wasn't an obedience to Christ, and it had a negative effect on Christ's ministry. Just by thinking of way of application, when Jesus works in our lives, we abide by his rules. He calls the shots. We do it his way, as prescribed in his word. We can be well-meaning. We can be zealous about something. But there needs to be great caution that we do not act in our zeal in a way that disobeys God. We should not seek to do things we are not authorized to do, even if we have zeal, lest we make people focus on the wrong things. How many times have you hindered the ministry of Christ? And then so many these days want to be ministers. They want to do great things for Christ. They want to go out and, and do things without the proper calling or without the proper training. And then when they act out of their, their zeal, without the proper qualifications or ordained ways, they often do more damage than good. The last thing we should want to do is hinder the ministry of Christ. Notice the consequence it has. Look at the verse. It says, The news spread so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And the people were coming to him from every quarter. This is exactly what Jesus didn't want. Many people, as a result, hear of a leper being cleansed. They want to come and see. They want to bring their sick. They didn't come for the word that Jesus preached. They came for the miracles and the signs and wonders. They came for all the wrong reasons. And as a result, now he could no longer be in the middle of town. He would be mobbed. He could no longer do that in peace. They didn't come for his messages, but for his miracles. But recall Jesus' primary mission in in Mark 1. He says Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. Remember in verse 38 last week, and he said, let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for this is why I came out. The purpose of Jesus' coming was to first proclaim the kingdom of God and repentance and faith in him. The miracles merely verified his message. It wasn't an end of themselves, so he didn't want people following because of that. And his message verified that he is and indeed the Messiah. His miracles verified that claim. Jesus wanted the message to get out, get out on his own terms. But because of this man's disobedience, his ministry was now hindered. Notice, Jesus starts this passage in the town, ministering, accepted, while the leper is outside the camp. Jesus was part of that community while the leper was an outcast. But after disobedience and misplaced zeal, Jesus now is hindered, and their positions have swapped. Jesus is now the one who is on the outside. The man is now among the community. While Jesus is outside the camp in the wilderness, the the leper man is, the previous man previously known as the leper, is now in the community. Yet God even uses the sin and disobedience for his sovereign purpose. 
And in doing so, gives us an amazing picture of the gospel yet again. Here we see an amazing picture. We see a picture of substitution. We see them swapping positions. Here we have a picture of what we can call the scapegoat. If you're familiar with uh, Leviticus 16, one way atonement was made was the priest would lay his hand on the scapegoat. And this, the laying your hand on the scapegoat symbolized that the sins were placed on the goat. And then the scapegoat would go out into the wilderness, outside the camp, and wander around as the outcast in the place, the substitute of the one who's touched it. The scapegoat was then put out from the presence of God and forced into isolation in the wilderness outside the camp. To be outside the camp, as we've seen, means to be unclean, unfit. It was a sign of rejection. It was a sign of God's judgment. But the scapegoat was a substitute for the sins of the people. And in the end of this story, we see Jesus is the one who was forced outside the camp. He has swapped places with this man. He is forced now to resort to the desolate places, the wilderness. This swapping places ultimately foreshadows us to a greater exchange that would happen. An exchange that would end with Jesus' earthly ministry on the, on the cross. And this is what Jesus does for us. He is our scapegoat. He is our substitute. He takes our sin upon himself. He takes our place. He receives the judgment of God and he receives it on Golgotha outside the camp. This is what he does on the cross. All our sin, all our shame, all our guilt is placed on him. He is then cast out. He is taken to a cross. He is humili humiliated, tortured, punished for things he did not deserve. He experienced everything that that wilderness is meant to be. He received the full, blunt force of the judgment of God. Even the Father turned his faith away, his face away, as our sins were placed on him. Jesus did this as our substitute. He did this in our place, so we would not have to do it. He suffered outside the the camp bearing our sins, bearing the judgment of God in our place. And it's almost like as Jesus touches the leper, he's willing to say, I am willing to change places. I am willing to do this so that you will become clean and acceptable in God's sight. And this is what Jesus does with sinners who have faith in him. Jesus takes a hold of us. He takes a hold of every sinner. He goes to the cross. Though he never sinned, he takes with him along with that his perfect righteousness. And that righteousness is credited to our account, our sin credited to his account. And God punishes on him the wrath for sin while we get credited with the righteousness of Christ. Without that, there is no hope. And then we are united to him by faith. He takes our sin. We get his righteousness. God can now say to us, you are clean. You are justified. This is a glorious exchange. Jesus Christ suffered outside the camp, taking our punishment and our sins upon himself to bear the punishment of God in our place. So, as we close, I ask you again, have you come to see your sinful condition before a holy and righteous God? Have you become so desperately self-aware of your need for cleansing? Are you self-aware of your spiritual corruption, that God's standard is absolute perfection, 
You must be holy for I am holy, he says. You must be perfect. One sin is worthy of hell for all eternity. Have you seen God's law and his righteous standard and realize you fall short, that you are a sinner? And the only way you can meet God's righteous standard is by placing your faith in another, by pleading and running to the one who has the cure. There's only one who can cleanse us from the deadly disease of sin. There's only one who can make us right and acceptable in God's sight. And it cannot just be ignored. You cannot just ignore your sin. As you read God's law, you should become more and more aware of what God requires of you and more and more aware of your depravity and how you fall short. There is no amount of good you can do to offset it and be acceptable in his sight. The Bible says all our good deeds are as filthy rags. What we need is spiritual cleansing. What we need is to be made well from our wretched state. We need to be completely clean. We need to recognize our sinful condition and run to Christ, who is the only one able to cleanse us from sin and bring us into true fellowship with God. So have you recognized that condition? Have you run to the Messiah, Jesus Christ? Jesus said he is more than willing. He is willing and able. He is compassionate. He will not cast out any who come to him. So have you been cleansed by Christ? If you have been cleansed of Christ, if that describes you here today, you have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. You now have a right standing with God. The payment for your sin has been met and satisfied in Christ. So now the call for you is to live in a way that is obedient to his commands. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. We are not to do things that we think, you know, are better better for us contrary to God's commands. We are to obey him. Because we love him. We are to serve him in the way that he commands us. While the timing was not proper for the leper to proclaim Jesus, it wasn't that time. Jesus now says, what I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Jesus says in Matthew uh, 28, 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. We are to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. We are to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. And this might mean rejection. It might mean persecution from the world. But we must be faithful to Christ. Hebrews 13, 12 says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Christ did that for you. Now out of love and thankfulness, you want to go and serve and be a witness for Christ, no matter the cost. So may we who have received his cleansing now go and worship and serve the king. Hebrews 9 says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the Sanctify for the purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish of God, purify your own conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So we are then called out of love and thankfulness for what he has done. He has cleansed us. We are called in obedience to now proclaim him to a lost and dying world and to live and serve him. So I ask you, does that describe you today? If you do not know him yet, do not die in your sin. 
Do not die in your unclean state, but be cleansed. Repent of your sins. Run and embrace Christ by faith. He alone can save. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will by no means cast out. Come to him. He is loving. He is compassionate, and he is willing. So do you want to be part of the kingdom? As Christ is expanding his kingdom and will consummate it when he returns, the only way to be part of it is be cleansed. Come to your cleansing Savior. Come to Jesus. You have a willing and able Savior. Be cleansed. And may you too sing, as we did earlier today, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. So because Jesus is the king of all the creation, who has the power over all realms, he alone has the power to cleanse. From all sickness and disease, thrust we should come to him by faith and worship the king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a magnificent Savior we have. One who is willing and able. One who will by no means cast out. Those who come to him, He will accept, Lord. We pray if there's any today who do not know you, that you would soften hard hearts, that you would help them realize their need for a Savior, that you'd help them realize their their sickness and disease of sin that they have. Come running to the one who has the cure. Come running to Jesus, and they will be met with a willing and able arms. So Lord, may today be the day of salvation for them. And Lord, out of love and thankfulness, now help us who know the power of this cleansing not take it for granted, but now want to love and serve Christ and obey him out of gratitude for what he's done for us. We pray that you help us do this by the power of your spirit. Pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.